Hey, welcome. It's Kurt Thompson, and I'm reviewing a breathing apparatus device. And originally, it's designed for patients that have had some type of surgery and they're trying to get their lungs back in order after anesthesia. But for us brass plane folks, and well, actually, I shouldn't be um, brassist, should I? Um, <laughs> Okay, let me not be a brassist, and let me say that it's for all wind musicians, vocalists, and woodwind players, as well as brass musicians. So, for most brass players, now I'm not really going to go into woodwind players and vocalists, but for most brass players, to get the ultimate best out of your playing, especially in the extreme upper register, you have to synchronize three stages of compressing the air. The first stage is the diaphragmatic breathing. Breathing as deep as you possibly can and putting as much pressure on the lungs and diaphragm. That's the first stage. The second stage is the bottleneck at your throat and tongue arch. And you've heard band directors say, don't pinch off your throat. Don't pitch the air with your throat. Uh, well, they're absolutely ridiculous and they're probably just regurgitating uh, what their instructor told them. That's nonsense. The only way you could not have a bottleneck and not pinch off the air at your throat would be if you were a dolphin or a whale. In other words, if you breathe straight up through the, a hole in the top of your head, then there's no pinching off. Um, but there's an L shape that happens when the air comes up to your throat, it makes a right angle and comes out your mouth. There's a bottleneck there, regardless of what your band director may say. There's a bottleneck there, there's going to be um, a resistance. That bottleneck combined with your tongue and tongue arch creates the second stage of compressing. And then the final third, uh, third phase of compressing the air would be at your aperture. You know, if you have a big <laughs> aperture loose, flapping your lips, um, or, you know, maybe let's just say on a reed instrument, maybe you're using a Rico number one reed and it's just um, soft and you, you're able to have a, a lot of air go in at one time. Um, well, you're not going to be compressing the air as efficiently. So these are the three stages. And what these devices, I have several tutorial, tutorials coming your way. What these devices actually work on is the first stage of compressing the air. The, for those of you who like analogies, the first stage of compressing the air is just like the principle of the jet engine. You know, the jet engine and the propeller plane are two different animals, right? Uh, you get a lot more power from the... Um, jet engine. In the jet engine, you can think of uh, scientifically blowing up a balloon and let it as, as much as you can before it pops and then letting it go. And you remember, you, you can see it kind of flutter around and go in circles around the room. That's the principle of jet propulsion. And that's actually what our first stage of compression is. We're, think of our lungs as a balloon. We're inhaling to the max and maybe even beyond that creating this ultimate pressure that on its own the energy wants to come out through our mouth it wants to expel you know through our mouth that energy is what is one third required to get the best tone the best endurance the best sound the best control and the best range so it makes sense if you're a vocalist if you're a sax player, I would say even more so if you're a flute player, really, it would really make sense to work on this stage of compressing the air. So I have several tutorials coming your way. And this, I might just leave this introduction for all three tutorials. So if, you, if you've seen one tutorial, you might have heard this introduction. But don't worry, I'll be going into the particular details of the new device. So anyway, I'm Kurt Thompson. You're going to see me do some demonstrations as well. So it won't just be a speaking video with some pictures. You're going to see me demonstrate these devices. And right now, right now I have three devices in mind. So you might see 
a series of three videos on diaphragmatic breathing, inspiration, and improving your respiratory system, and the first stage of compression for any brass player, vocalist, or woodwind player. Please go over to Patreon, become a supporter, support my channel and my work and what I'm doing. I really need your help. Thank you so much. This is Kurt Thompson. You are looking at the expand -a lung breathing device, and you're going to see me demonstrate this one. I've been using this one for years, in fact, uh, more than a decade. It really is the best device that I've used, and you're, you're going to see several other reviews on these devices, which are worthy, but this one is by far the best, and it really is quite amazing uh, what it can do for you. So anybody that has fun in music through their breath, whether a, a flautist, a saxophone player, a tuba player, um, or a female or male vocalist, uh, you're going to benefit by this one. Um, also, if you speak for a living or have to do a lot of public speaking, or you do voiceovers, you'll be benefited by this particular device. And then finally, it's actually marketed to athletes. So swimmers, Ironman competitors, triathletes, um, these type of folks. I guess it would apply to people that are weekend warriors, you know. You get out there and you play, you know, hoops you know, with your buds on the weekend and kill yourself. Or you're, maybe you're on a baseball or softball team, that kind of thing. Or maybe you do a lot of hiking or whatever. So this is um, the device that spans the gamut. It really does work. And for, there's, for most musicians, I've devised a way to do it that I think it works the best after so many years of doing this. And I don't do the blowout, the exhalation. Um, I only work on the inhalation, or as they say, technically, inspiration. So we're going to be working on that. You're going to see me demonstrate that. And this is a device that I mandate that people get when they're in my 16-week course. It um, really is a mandatory. It's not an optional thing because it really does make a difference. It's part of the first stage of compression. And if you can, let's just say that you have chop problems and you, you've done all you can to build up your chop strength and you've hit a wall, well, you, you, I'm going to help you overcome that. But in the interim, you can be improving the other two stages of compression, which would be diaphragmatic breathing, and the expanded lung concerns that, and the bottleneck at your throat and tongue arch. So there's a lot of ways to improve yourself and get around a few hurdles when it comes to your chops. And breathing correctly and syncing up all three stages of compression is mandatory. You must do that. So if you don't, you'll end up always having that strained type of sound and choppiness in your plane. Even if you do build up your chops, you'll you'll still have a choppiness and a strain to your sound. You won't have that effortless Bill Chase and Maynard Ferguson way of playing and sounding. So the expanded lung is an amazing device. And I have two ways that I do it, two ways that I've been teaching it now. I think, can I safely say more than 10 years? Yes, I have been teaching this to students now for more than 10 years. And uh, I'm sure they've gotten fantastic results especially if they've been using it i'm trying to go back to 10 years ago anybody that has been using this when i first started started with this if they've been doing it for a decade they surely have really increased their lung capacity and the mechanism for um, inhaling now by doing this what you're going to be helping yourself out later your older self is you're not going to be one of these persons that walks around with that green oxygen container and the the rubber hoses you know up their nose you know have you seen those people um they they walk around they have a cart and they walk they wheel an oxygen container around and uh, you're not going to be one of those typically those people um smoke too much or maybe they were a coal miner or maybe they worked around asbestos or something like that um, but um, 
I'm here to tell you that I don't believe in that. I think that if you work your lungs properly, like we wind musicians, that you're just not going to end up like that. You know, I'm also a firm believer in cardiovascular stuff. So extreme hiking, walking, running, jogging, biking, um, you name it. Uh, I think people that are involved in that during their lifetime are not going to be you know, 80 years old, fumbling around with a green oxygen container. That's just not going to happen unless you have the worst luck in the world and you're one in a million that happens to you. I just don't believe otherwise it will. So by using these devices, you can stack the odds even further in your corner that when you get to be an old timer, you'll be able to walk around and do whatever you want and you won't have shortness of breath. So let me go ahead and whip this out and show you how I like to do it over to patreon become a supporter support my channel and my work and what i'm doing i really need your help thank you so much this is kurt thompson Expand along. Okay, now you're going to be able to watch me do some demonstrations with it. Kind of looks like a like a fighter's mouthpiece, right? Or a football player's mouth guard. I mean, minus this part. If you took this part off, it would look just like a you know a mouth guard. Okay, this is the one that I've been using for wow, uh, pretty much coming on a decade. I think. Personally, I've been using it longer than that, but I've been teaching this now for uh, a decade, since 2009. And anybody that got with me 10 years ago, I'm sure that no matter what they've done with their music, they've really increased their health when it comes to breathing. And that's, you know, basically, folks, if you think about it, when you die, you take a last breath and your heart beats for the last time. Those are the two, the two big reasons that you die. You do no longer breathe and your heart no longer beats. So those are pretty important, right? You take care of your heart and you take care of your ability to breathe. Uh, that might just tilt the odds that you live a longer and healthier life. So uh, this is part of that. Now this guy is amazing for the first stage of compression as I already alluded to. And I'm going to put a link in the description. You really need to get this. If you're even halfway serious, let's just, let's just say that you just sing in the church choir. Um, you still should get this. I mean, it would really help out if you speak for a living or if you're upper middle management and you have to make lots of presentations and things like that at work, uh, this would help you out. People who do voiceovers for a living and um, any kind of musician that makes their music with their breath, be singers, vocalists, uh, flute players, bassoonists, oboe players, English horn, I mean, trumpet, tuba, you name it, the whole baritone sax. I mean, this guy is going to help you out. You're just not going to regret getting this. You're going to be very happy that you did. So I have now there's, there's, this comes with some directions and it tells you to both blow, exhale into it and then inhale. You can do what you want, but at least for brass players, we don't need anything else. Another exercise to blow because what that's going to do is going to start to activate the chops and it might even become isometrical. So I don't have anybody that studies with me blow into this. We, we already blow into the horn, right? And we have other things that we do that just constantly work the face. I'm not focused on trying to get any facial activity, the musculature involved. I really want this just to focus on the diaphragm and the inhalation of the breath. And so uh, you heard in the introductory, now I made um, two introductions. One was specifically for the expand along that you've already heard. The other one is a general one that I'm putting on all the video tutorials regarding diaphragmatic breathing. And you, know, you already heard me mention the, the stages of compression, so I don't need to go into that. They are very important. And if you're sitting there one, wondering why you don't have a good range on your instrument, um, or why you can't get a great sound or a big sound, I mean, how many saxophone players I'm looking at you right now. How many saxophone players sound and play with a
fabulous ferocity and energy of a David Sanborn. What's that? I'm hearing crickets. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Nobody. Hardly nobody. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to go listen to, let's say, five pro sax players in any kind of uh, situation, big band, uh, rhythm and blues, uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, small time jazz orchestra playing standards, um, you name it, um, smooth jazz. All five are not going to have the amazing ability and sound and energy of a David Sanborn. You just not. You just didn't develop yourself to that level. And part of it might be because of your breathing. You really need to focus on breathing and developing that diaphragmatic breathing and it's even more so important for brass players because uh, hello we don't have an octave key and we don't have 12 15 17 20 keys to get all our notes it comes from our air and the manipulation of our embouchure so that said i'm trying to drive home a point this um, diaphragmatic breathing is very critical and a lot of people don't get that because a lot of band directors steered you the wrong way when they said Airflow, open up your mouth. Oh, ooh, ooh, oh. They didn't understand that the warm, slow breathing, the uh, air coming out is not going to help you. That air comes out, all your air can come out in a second or two. <sighs> that wasn't even a second. There, all my air just came out. What's that going to help me do on the instrument? It's not going to help me do anything. You have to learn how to compress that air. And that's what your band director forgot to tell you, maybe because they didn't know themselves. This is one thing that's going to help you. It's one part of the puzzle. Three stages of compression. Uh, the expanded lung is the premier diaphragmatic breathing device. In fact, I was just noticing on the site now, they, um, the Navy SEALs are actually using this. So before, uh, when I first started teaching this, it was um, Ironman competitors and triathletes and long distance swimmers and runners and cyclists and stuff like that. But now this is... Uh, I guess the reputation of this has gone so far around the globe and everywhere that it's come back to the Navy SEALs and they've tried it and they actually have their Navy SEALs candidates use this to improve their conditioning. So, okay, now the two ways that I do it, enough lecture, but this is important stuff. I mean, you really should be hanging on my every word. Um, at the very least, you can see I prove uh, what I say. I practice what I preach is another way to say it. And this guy has helped me out. I do this two ways. Now, there's a way to dial up the resistance. You may have noticed that this there's a black extension on the rubber part here. You maybe thought, well, what is that? If I get it close enough, there you go. You can see that this handle moves. See that? Now, what this does is it uh, allows a certain amount of air to escape. And it will open up to um, uh, letting the most air that will escape for this particular device. Or you can close it off to where nothing comes in and out. So what I like to do is to um, play around with the resistance. So one way to, to do this would be to put a drag on your, a slight drag on your breathing, in your inhale. So that's all the way open, no resistance. And one technique would be just to exhale all your air and just breathe all your air and just breathe in. And that's putting a drag. <coughs> excuse me, it's really working. It's putting a drag on your inhalation, or I guess I guess in the medical community they call it inspiration. So that's one way to do it. Now another way I like to do is a short burst is to add some resistance. This is the second way to do it, is to add some resistance. For, let me just give you an example of what happens when you turn it all the way in. Can't breathe anything there. So what I like to do is dial it in and take several short bursts of inhalations where you really can't get that much air. Just pl placing a tremendous load on the diaphragm to pull the air down and create that low pressure system in your body where the air rushes in. There's a vacuum being created there. And this puts a drag on your diaphragm. It must compensate and get stronger. So here we go. Let me open it back up. 
Okay, so let me close it up a little bit and do the second way I like to do. Okay, you probably notice there's a reduction there. Now here's what I do when I have the resistance on. I'm being as dramatic and as energetic as I can and trying my best, like my life depended on it, to get as much air I can in that short little burst. So I feel like there's a different action happening on my diaphragm than when I just use little to no resistance and take one long breath. Both are good. I am convinced and I will guarantee you that if you get this and start working on it, it won't take more than a week for you before you start to go, wait a minute, <laughs> this thing really works. You will notice the benefit, whether your tone is more centered, whether your tone sounds better and richer and more vibrant, whether you're able to sustain longer passages, whether, you're, whether you have better endurance. And whether you're may, able to make your voice boom if you're a speaker and you have to speak to a large auditorium and you want your voice to carry out, this will actually do the job. I'm Kurt Thompson. There's a link in the description. I would highly recommend you get this and may, maybe pick up a couple for people you know that are involved in music and or speaking. Um, or if you have someone that's a crazy nut that likes to do those Ironman competitions, uh, uh, pick up one of these for them. Kurt Thompson here. I hope you enjoyed this very informative tutorial. It's going to be quite influential in what you do in regards to music. Uh, go ahead and like this. Look for that little red triangle, uh, rectangle down there that says subscribe. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you can see the more videos related to this and diaphragmatic breathing coming your way. And if you feel so inclined, make a comment down below and maybe even a suggestion uh, for another video if you like. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson. Welcome to the first day of the four month brass upper register program. And this video series is going to go just about as close and follow the same track um, we would if we were just live, you and I, over the phone or via Skype. So that's um, one of the um, values is that, um, well, first of all, you got to remember this is a momentum based program. So you are starting out with zero of my techniques and in four months you will be able to do all 65 techniques in one day. That's quite a feat of strength. So there is that momentum aspect. I'm going to ask you to try to do your best to keep this momentum going even though we're not interacting live. The, um, 
the momentum aspect is actually, actually like one of the secret ingredients in my course, if you want to really call it that. It's um, just the ability just to kind of um, sneak a little bit more techniques and build more strength a little bit by little bit. Um, almost like boiling a frog in warm water, right? They don't know that they're cooked until it's too late. Same thing with you. Uh, you won't really realize all the strength that's happening until you take a look back and like especially at the halfway point where you can do 30 of these techniques in one day and feel great and you're stronger. Um, it'll dawn on you at some point. So that's how this works. We trickle out between three techniques and sometimes all the way up to eight or nine techniques in, um, in a weekly sitting. The format of the Brass Upper Register course goes like this if you are working with me live and I want to make it pretty close if when, we're, when you're following this video tutorial. The first four lessons are all brand new techniques. The fifth lesson, there are no brand new techniques and it's a time for review, a time to recap, a time to really go back and do a little dusting, a little polishing, a little shedding, make sure that you got the techniques down. Now, and then I'll just continue on with the format. So then lesson six through nine would be all new techniques again. Lesson 10 would be a big review. We go back and recap. Lesson 11 would typically typically be live lesson face-to-face -face, uh, where I'm going to be demonstrating some techniques over using Skype video. We don't have to worry about that here because I can demonstrate the techniques um, to your right through this uh, media. Lessons um, 12 through 15 would again be all new techniques. And then the last lesson, the 16th week, uh, would be kind of a recap and just a you know, powwow and saying our, saying our goodbyes and all that kind of good stuff. So that said, you and I don't have the ability to do a review, obviously, through this media. So I'm making an option, and you really need to consider it, that um, you take advantage of some type of review with me live. So you will have gone through four of these lessons, and uh, it would be good if I could hear you do them, answer any questions that you may have, and uh, basically we can do the review by phone because that's how I normally would do it anyway. If you're outside the U.S., we would just do it by Skype audio. But it's good for me to spot check things and make sure you're doing um, the techniques the way you're supposed to. And uh, also I listen for things like um, any extra air in your tone, brittleness, tightness, stiffitis, loss of flexibility, and things like that that um, are kind of part and parcel of really working up a register. You really have to be careful of that and keep that at bay. And there's some things built into the course that will do that. So anyway, this four-month video course, this is the first video that you've likely gotten. And we're going to be doing exactly what I would do with you if you were speaking to me right now on the phone or over Skype. Now you can uh, transpose that or adjust that um, regard, depending on what instrument you play. So triple pedal concert B flat. So we're going way, way, way down. Um, that this would be even be low for tuba players. I mean, it's getting down there pretty low. It's not really um, accurate for me to say it's a duplicate of Claude Gordon stuff because it really is not. And I also put my own twist on it. So I just mentioned Claude Gordon because it does have the essence of Claude Gordon, but I'm I'm not really plagiarizing or, or borrowing his stuff note for note. I, I kind of do my own thing with it. So um, this is one of the uh, mega techniques of the course. Um, oh, by, this, by the way, this reminds me. The default for all techniques in this course is every day. That's about a fortissimo double C. You may wonder how I'm actually trying to fake my way up there and not get it. What I'm doing is I'm just scooting my lips out of the aperture. So when I was doing those hitting air notes, of course, you know, I could hit those notes. But what I was doing was I was widening the aperture almost to the point of, of a low C uh, positioning. So when I was, we hear all the air, it's because the aperture was very, very wide, as if I was playing below the staff. That's how I was able to do that. So anyway... Uh, I think that I've given you enough information, regardless of where your range is at, even if it's a lower than high C, if it's above high C, if it's above double C, double C you got the great format for this one here. And if you really follow uh, my advice, don't overthink this technique, guys. Don't overthink it. Just do what I tell you to do on this one, including the rest, including the days off. And I think that you're going to be very, very happy with the results that come in. And they're going to come in uh, much, much quicker um, than you might think. 
Um, some people get results in this in this particular one in, in as little as just a couple of weeks, and that's when you compare a couple of weeks versus 52 weeks. I mean, that's just miraculous in my opinion. So this one is, this one is fantastic. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. You can play along with it um, every day. Um, not every day, of course, but every time that you do the particular technique, which would be every other day or every two days or however you decided to um, fashion in your program. And um, it's Kurt Thompson. Don't forget TrumpetSizzle.com. TrumpetSizzle.com. There are other um, um, products there that you might like to enhance your playing. My site is, is mainly devoted to the power, endurance, and range aspect of playing. And so that's what most of my programs and my um, video tutorials do tend to focus on. And uh, there's no coincidence there. It is the most problematic area for any brass player, endurance and range. I'm Kurt Thompson. Have a good one. Okay, we're back with the second installment on compression breathing, the three stages of compression. Um, who can tell me right now what was the first stage of compression for a brass plane? Anybody remember? Did you watch the first installment or are you just catching this one? If you didn't watch the first installment, I'll try to remember to put a link to the first installment, um, which is diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so I'm not going to go through all that because I already did. So there might be a link um, down in the description and um, you could probably click on that first and watch that and see how this all works. So diaphragmatic breathing, creating that um, pressure down in your lungs and your tummy and your diaphragm area. Now we're coming to the second stage of compression and this is the second installment. I'm Kurt Thompson. So you saw me holding up um, two cylindrical objects, one, I guess you figured out it's a straw. This is an empty paper, um, sorry, the empty toilet roll holder, about the same size as a paper towel holder anyway. And so what does this have to do with today's lesson? <laughs> I'm always coming up with some, some good ways to teach, aren't I? But it's important. Stuff like this helps people get it. So second stage of compression is about there is a bottleneck despite what any orchestral player tells you about open up your throat open up your you know the cavity in your mouth open everything up keep it open don't pinch there is a bottleneck that happens at the throat if there wasn't a bottleneck and if we had an opening here on the top of her head and went straight out then that would be op completely 100 percent free open um airflow right the nature of it coming out here and, and making a, like an upside down L and coming out this way automatically means it's not going to be 100% free air flowing. Just not going to be. There is going to be a bottleneck there at the throat regardless. And that's if you have your tongue dropped into an ah position. Ah, or low C positioning for trumpet folks, I'm just using trumpet for example, is a no compression tongue position. Ah, you're not going to get much compression from the second stage. You can still get it from the first stage. You can still get it from the third stage, which we haven't talked about yet. But as far as uh, the second stage, you're only going to get a natural organic compression simply because of the bottleneck. The bottleneck of the throat. It's not, keep in mind, the air is not coming all the way out to the top of our head. If it came out here, complete unrestricted airflow. But anytime you take something, a hose or something like this, and you bend it, that automatically um, pinches things off to some degree, automatically uh, puts a squeeze on it, automatically makes a bottleneck. So just the nature of our human body up here and out here, we already have um, a natural bottle bottleneck and it happens right here at the tongue arch in the throat. A lot of people think their tongue is just here in your mouth. Your tongue actually goes all the way down um, here. It actually goes a lot further than you think. 
And so when you raise your tongue up into an E position, this starting here and creating that more of a bottleneck at your throat all the way to the, to the, um, the roof of your mouth right behind your teeth. So this is the second stage of compression tongue arch. In fact, I've done a couple of really in-depth video tutorials, so I don't feel the need to actually do a duplicate or be redundant in this particular installment. No need, no need to. So you can either look for, you can either search tongue arch in, in the normal Google search, you, or sorry, normal YouTube search, you can put tongue arch Kurt Thompson, or if you're on my channel and you're able to search my channel, then you can just put tongue arch. And you're going to come up with several videos that where I really explain and get in real nitty gritty, almost disgusting detail about the tongue arch. So tongue arch in the bottleneck here at the throat is the second stage of compression. It's where um, if you had a garden hose and you took a garden hose and you had a certain amount of water flow and you took it and you bent it, you know, you would hear that noise that it makes, but you would also know that the water is going to spray out faster. Or if you put your thumb over the end of a hose and cover it almost all of it up, you know it would get harder to do because the water is going to um, spray out like a jet. So anyway, to make to illustrate a point, um, for people who don't have the tongue arched, arched down, don't have it mastered, or in my experience, it seems like a lot of people think they actually have it, but they don't, um, you end up using a no compression um, second stage uh, technique and it doesn't really work out too well with the other stages. So no compression would be like this. I'm going to take some paper, just a little bit, let me get a little spit wad. Okay, just a little bit. Now I'm going to wad it up. Of course, it's a spitball, so i got to put it in my mouth. I'm going to put it here in, in the um, paper towel holder, right kind of at the beginning. I'm going to take a big breath and blow. Okay, it came, actually came out a little bit, right? It came out with a certain velocity. Now, in fact, it actually went about two feet on the carpet. So now, I'm going to also do another spitball. Put it. And put it in the straw. Now, folks, what do you think is going to happen here? You saw it's in the straw. What do you think is going to happen with this when I blow it? I'm going to blow. Actually, I'm going to blow as much air as I can, but it will be quite a lot less air than I was blowing through this guy. Bam! Do you hear that? That thing hit hit my stand and bounced back within a half a second. Here it is on the floor. I mean, let me do that again. I mean, it was like almost like a bullet. Watch. I'll do it right at the camera. You see that? The speed had to be, I'm going to say 20 times or more than the speed that I got from this. It's quite incredible. Here it is again. I'll do it one more time. I'm just having fun. But um, now I'm, I'm blowing some um, fast air because of this restricted space. I'm also blowing a lot less air. You know, so when you hear band directors and other people um, especially non-brass players, but it could be any band director who's a generalist or it could be your typical classical uh, PhD, DMA, university professor, and they say, more air, don't pinch, open up your throat. That's fine when you're playing low C's and when you're playing middle C's, not when you're playing double G's. Here's your double G and double C.
I bet it went so fast you couldn't see it. It hit the camera and you might can uh, slow this down. It hit the camera and then came back. I mean, it's just amazingly fast. Now, what does it have to do with brass playing? This is where most people screw up the second stage. They keep their jaw dropped down low. Uh, like you got an egg in your mouth. You're playing like that. I've seen people play like that and they pooch out their lips. You really think you're going to vibrate these lips fast after you make them thick and pouting? No, ma'am, you are not. This is the uncompressed zone of stage two, lower look, the jaw, the lower jaw is dropped down low, tongue is flat. Ah, uh, this is exactly what your band director, exactly what your university professor is wanting you to do when they say, "Don't pinch off the air, don't pinch off your throat, keep an open sound, keep the air moving, airflow, all this kind of stuff." Right? That is actually what they want you to do, and they are actually correct when you are playing in the staff and below what most of these people fail to delineate for you because they can't really do it themselves is when you get into upper register upper register let's remind you what that is anybody know i oh, know that's not it you know a high g right above the staff is not upper register that's upper middle register double c no nope, that's that's actually extreme upper register upper register is high c high d high e high E, high F, double G. That's the um, tessitura of the upper register for a trumpet and you can um, transpose that to your particular brass instrument. So uh, these people that have all the advanced degrees and uh, are uh, connected and able to get into the universities and you've heard them play, right? Well, anyway, these people are regurgitating what their um, um, DMA told them when they were getting their degrees it's just a, a regurgitation of generation after generation after generation what they're saying works fine when you're playing below the staff so if you got a concert tomorrow and you're playing come to Jesus and whole notes and your highest note is the second line G in the staff yes they are correct don't pinch off your throat ah oh, open position no compression if you're playing in the one o'clock lab band at North Texas State University, or UNT as they call it now, and you're starting off on Gabriel, or not Gabriel, start off on Birdland, uh, what the first three notes would be high B, high D, double G, right? I'm swearing, ladies, if you try to keep your throat open, your jaw dropped down low, your tongue dropped down low, you are going to crash and burn. And if you have the chops to actually get those notes, it's going to suck horribly. It's going to be bad. You might not even make it to the end of that tune because you're going to be burning up your chops. This is really important. It's really probably, if not the most important stage of compression, it's, it's right up there. Because uh, even if you had one lung and couldn't perfectly do the execute the first stage of compression, but you had this, you're still going to be do, doing okay. So anyway, you saw for yourself, you witnessed it. A wide open cylindrical, which is keeping your throat open. Hey, don't pinch off the air. Jimmy, use more air. More air, bigger sound, Jimmy. Well, if that is, professor is talking to Jimmy, who happens to be playing high A's up to high C's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's less air, Jimmy, and more faster compression, Jimmy, when you're playing up to around high C and higher. That would be the correct thing to tell that student or that particular player. So you just watch the second stage of compressed air, compression, air compression, as it relates to brass instruments. And you saw it in action, folks. Saw it in action. This is when you're using the tongue arch. And this is when you got the low C, no compression position. You can think of this. It's like when you're fogging up a mirror or, or a glass in your car. You know how kids do. That's low C. That's no compression. That's your throat and mouth all the way as open as it, it can be. The most quantity of air comes out. It's warm air and it's slow moving air. Great for lower register work and maybe middle register work, but definitely not when you start to climb out of the staff and get into the upper register. I'm Kurt Thompson. And as I always like to say, my story, and I'm sticking to it.
Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. How can you find the best trumpet lessons by the best trumpet teacher, the best one for you? That's what this video blog vlog is going to be about today. And, you know, it's kind of a interesting and obvious question that uh, people don't ask until a lot of times they've gone through several different trumpet instructors and trumpet teachers, you know, for their trumpet lessons. And uh, how did I arrive to conclude that? Well. Um, number one, it happened to me when I was younger. But number two, a lot of people that come to me for my course, of, especially on trumpet high notes and trumpet upper register, trumpet uh, endurance, all that kind of good stuff, almost always they will have studied from somebody else and not just their local community teacher. Um, I've had people that have studied with Roy Stevens. I've had people that have studied with Bill Adam, um, um, Doc Reinhardt. And I've had people that I'm um, actually studied with um, uh, Wayne Bergeron. I had I've had a couple of students that have taken the $120 uh, lesson with Arturo. I've had people that have come from um, some of my um, more direct competitors that do a lot of similar things uh, that I do as far as uh, helping trumpet players online um, with trumpet lessons. So uh, they all arrive at the same conclusion that whatever they were doing might have been okay and might have done them a little bit good but did, didn't really get them where they wanted to as far as reaching their goals. So really in a nutshell there's two simple things that you can follow to end up with the best trumpet lessons for you by the best trumpet teacher whether that be an online trumpet teacher um, or um, an in-person um, uh, trumpet teacher as well. So the first thing is I mean, this is so simple, but I guess even myself when I was younger, I just kind of glossed over it. Study with a trumpet teacher. Take trumpet lessons from a trumpet teacher that actually can do what you want to accomplish. That's number one. And number two, you got to make sure that the trumpet teacher you want to take trumpet lessons from has demonstrated results. And that means in the form of students that have already taken from him or her. So those are the two things that we're going to talk about a little bit today. So the first one is um, pretty straightforward. I mean, let's, let's give you an example. Let's just say that you want to be the best orchestral trumpet player in the world. And orchest orchestral music, chamber music is your thing. And you wanted to find some trumpet lessons by a trumpet teacher that could help you accomplish that goal. Now, if you start taking lessons with me, I can help you out with some of the technique and pedagogy that will enable you, able you to be a better orchestral player, but um, I've got to be honest, and I'm not going to beat around the bush. I don't play orchestral music all that much. I've never been in the top symphonies. I never have really wanted to, and it's just not my thing. I mean, it's just not my thing. I am not an expert at it, or even close. So if you came to me and studied with me for a couple years, and maybe you've never even told me about your goal about being an orchestral trumpet player you're going to get good in certain areas but wouldn't it be better for you to pick one of the top orchestral guys in your community or nearby community and study with that individual guys or gals so um, there, that's one example right there I mean 
get with the person that can play the way you want to play. That would be number one. Another example would be, um, let's flip-flop that. So I just give you a reason why you wouldn't want to take lessons. But um, I'm not trying to use reverse psychology on you here and steer you away from me. But uh, by and large, the people that actually come to take trumpet lessons with me actually do so uh, because they want to in increase their um, their trumpet high notes, their trumpet apparatus, their, their, their endurance on their trumpet, the strength of their embouchure here for trumpet, all that kind of good stuff. That's why people t tend to come to me uh, for lessons. And they also want to learn how to um, either get in the, the jazz game as far as commercial jazz and lead trumpet and rock. Um, or they already know how to do that and they want to go up to the next level and really become one of the top tier lead trumpet players. Um, that would be when you start playing books that tend to have a lot of, a lot of notes in the lead trumpet section above F's and G's, um, F's and double G's. So that would be your top tier um, kind of lead trumpet playing, and you already know what that is. Louis Bellson, Buddy Rich, um, Maynard Ferguson, uh, uh, big fat band stuff. So that, and then there's other lesser known um, charts in composers and bands, but still have stuff above the F and double G. I mean, that stuff is raunchy and difficult to play. Raunchy in, in a good way. I mean, it's it's. Um, it's tough. It's tough stuff, especially when you got to play more than one chart. So, uh, if you're taking um, from the world's greatest um, second book player, jazz improv, he doesn't really, or she doesn't really do much more than that. That's how they make. It. Maybe they live in New York, and maybe all they do is just jazz, jazz combo, jazz this, you know, um, jazz at Sunday brunches, you know, all that stuff. And that's all they do. And you were taking lessons from him or her. And just because of the reputation and that they're a good player as a trumpet as a trumpet player, maybe they even they even have a good reputation as a trumpet lesson teacher. But you never really told them about your goals, and um, you might spin your wheels with them, you know, for a year before you figured out they're not going to help me become the best lead trumpet player in the world. And the reason is obvious: they don't do lead trumpet that much. They might do it on a gig here or there, but basically they're a, they're a, they're a jazzer, they're a second book player, or you know, small combo jazz trumpet. So you want to get with someone who specializes. And that brings up kind of the last point of this. Um, there are people that are all-arounders when it comes to trumpet lessons and trumpet teachers. They can pretty much do decent at a lot of the aspects of trumpet. And what I mean by that is you'll get a guy who could sit in on the second book and sound pretty decent. He could also get up there and play some lead. And if we're talking about, you know, I want to say he, I really mean he or she. I'm just using he for um, simplicity. Uh, we, we can pick the she and say that um, she could go sit in a jazz combo somewhere. She could go, go in the or orchestra and play there. So that's kind of an all-arounder. They can, maybe they're doing sessions and things like that. But for you, if you really want to accomplish a certain goal, it would be better to really focus on what that goal is and get with someone who specializes and someone who is the best in that particular uh, technique on the trumpet. I'm trying to remember, but I think it was Chet Baker. Um, he was. I, I'm trying to remember where this came up. It might have been that big two-hour um, kind of biography on his life. But he made a remark about um, how to be successful in life is to find something that you're good at and make sure that you're better at it than everybody else. And, every, and then everything, everything else will take care of itself. And I thought that was pretty unique. I thought that was, um, well, maybe it's not unique, but I thought it was practical and irrelevant because really you want to, you do want to get good at something and be the best at it, right? So it makes sense if you actually want to learn a specific technique on trumpet. you got to take trumpet lessons with a trumpet teacher who is actually an expert in that particular area. So... That's kind of last point. So you, you don't want an all-arounder. All-arounder is good for when you're in fifth grade and junior high and high school, whatever. But, I mean, at some point, you'll go into a direction that you really love. Classical, baroque kind of music, you know, chamber music. Or it could be just, you just love um, listening to Miles and Chet and Coltrane and all those guys. And you just want to be, a, you know, a jazz, a jazz trumpet player. And so you got to find someone that specializes in that and uh, not an all-arounder. Okay, so we talked about, we're talking about right now, just to recap, um, how can you find the best trumpet lessons by the best trumpet teacher out there, whether it be online or in person. 
and we discussed one of the main points is make sure that that uh, particular trumpet teacher can demonstrate the proficiency and expertise in what you actually want to accomplish. So that's very, very important. Now, number two, just because someone can play and is an awesome trumpet player doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be able to teach you and that you'll be able to get the information that they already got inside your noggin and become that good. I'll give you a couple of interesting two cases. And it's very interesting because they're both probably the two best trumpet players that walk the face of this earth. Maynard Ferguson, trumpet player Maynard Ferguson, and trumpet player Maurice Andre. Now, it's interesting and almost a little bit spooky that both had um, two, both had sons that um, I guess originally started out playing trumpet. I think Maynard's son Bentley actually switched to bass. Um, but anyway, this is all legend. You know, I didn't obviously I didn't talk to sit down with Maynard and talk to him about it. But this is what I've heard, and, it, and based on it from several accounts, it seems to be pretty much factual. Um, Maynard Ferguson couldn't teach his own son um, trumpet the way he plays. Listen to that. Maynard Ferguson couldn't show his own son how to play extremely, superbly well like he does on the trumpet with the power and the range and all the stuff that he does. Um, now, some people might argue, well, who, who wants to take trumpet lessons from their dad? You know, maybe they don't get along. Well, I mean, you can play devil advocate all you want with these two guys. The, the bottom line is, when you have a supernatural talent like Maynard Ferguson and Maurice Andre, a lot of it is talent. Yes, they did work in practice, but my friends, you're talking about two of the most talented uh, trumpet players in the world, and, and there might be a lot of what they do that they don't even know how they do it themselves because they just have a natural talent. So that was Maynard Ferguson, couldn't teach his, um, his own son trumpet, had to send him away to be taught by somebody else. Maurice Andre, same thing. Had to send his son away to be taught by somebody else. So I hope that highlights and turns a light bulb that just because you're, going, oh, you're looking at someone and going, oh my God, they're, they're such an awesome trumpet player. The best in the world. I got to take lessons from that person. Mm -mm. You might want to take a lesson just to say that you had a lesson with them. Uh, but here comes the point two of uh, this discussion today. You can take lessons from them and expect to get great results as long as they have students that can demonstrate what they learned from from them. So that's that's part two of this uh, video. So part one was. Find a trumpet lesson teacher who can, um, who 